Um, hopefully this is coming through for you guys. Yeah, we can see the screen, uh, uh, Rick. Yeah, I think it's all good. Sound is also good, yeah. Cool, that's great. Okay. I've very diligently worked out today with multiple monitors so I could do presentations and other things and then realized that, of course, screen sharing isn't going to work on that. So let's start with DEC. Um, I think we've, we've got about 90 minutes today, so we can take a nice relaxed run at this. Um, what I'm, I'm going to do is talk to you tonight about um, how Azure resource templates are really the way to go for doing your your modern Azure deployments. Now, I'm going to focus on IaaS, but to be fair, um, it doesn't have to be just virtual machines, things like that. You could be deploying SQL Azure. You could be deploying, um, hopefully, ultimately, pretty much everything. As, as the, the, the teams are, uh, are working, they're plugging all the different resource providers into this model. So you should be able to deploy really quite complex solutions using this method, ultimately. So who am I? My name is Rick Hepworth. My name is Rick Hepworth. Starting badly. Um, I'm IT director at Black Marble, as you've already heard. Um, I'm now in my second year as an Azure MVP, and I'm also a VTSP for Microsoft, which basically means I do free sales for them. Um, you can see there my Twitter handle, my blog, um, and if you particularly want to hook up with me on LinkedIn, that's on there as well. So, what are we going to cover today? Three basic things. What are resource templates? Why should we use them? Um, and how do we create them? And I'm going to do that by going through a few slides, and then what I'm going to do is go fairly fairly deep into a project that uh, we've been working on here at Black Marble to deploy a pretty complex environment. I've actually um, reduced the number of machines that I'm deploying in the demo that I'm going to do for you from the, the, the eight or nine we actually do to about three that really illustrate the core concepts. Um, and I'm going to show you how to create the, the, a new resource template in Visual Studio. I'm going to talk about how you actually manage them, um, add resources, and, and that kind of stuff. With what are resource templates? Now, as many of you will know, we are now in the world of the Azure Resource Manager. So classic resources, which is what the old um, manage.windowsazure.com portal only created, are starting to be on their way out. The new model is this, this is your resource manager, which is what you get if you use the, the Ibiza portal, the portal.azure.com, and choose to deploy um, using the new deployment model rather than classic in, if, it, if it gives you an option. Effectively, what we have now is a, a service layer in Azure, which has a, a very powerful REST API that we can talk to to deploy and manage our resources. Um, and those are arranged into resource groups, and we've got role-based access control and a whole bunch of really, really nice tooling to let us deploy and manage and remove and control access to our resources. So resource template is a JSON format file, which is a, a configuration file for our Azure resources. It's, it's basically a, a, a declaration of what resources we want and how we want to configure them. And for a resource template, there's also an accompanying parameters file. So in a resource template, we can, we can specify questions, if you like, that, that we want to um, pass in at the beginning. Usually, most often, it's things like, um, where do we want to deploy this to? North Europe, North America, India, wherever. Um, and maybe what do we want to call virtual machines, that kind of stuff. Um, so the parameters file effectively answers those questions. The important thing to remember about Azure resource templates is they're idempotent, which means you can reapply them. Effectively, what we're saying is we are identifying what we want the configuration of our environment to be, and we can apply this template to create that deployment and that, that environment, or we can reapply the template to reassert that configuration should it have changed. Um, and that gives us some interesting um, options and opportunities when we start deploying resource templates, as I'll, I'll show you later on. Why do we want to use them, though? Many of us have only just got the hang of, of using the old Azure PowerShell. Many more people I know still prefer to deploy these things by hand through the GUI. Bad people, bad people. Learn PowerShell or learn golf has been the mantra for a long time. Now, really, the mantra is you ought to be using these things. They fit really, really well into the new approach of Config as Code. 
excuse me, quick slip of coffee. Um, so I like them because we can version control them along with the source code for our projects, which means that we always know if we're going to deploy that the deployment template matches the version of code that we're pushing out. They're much easier to read than PowerShell scripts. It's a lot easier to figure out when you look at these things what it is that you're deploying and what the configuration is than having to wade through lots and lots and lots of linear PowerShell that would, for example, create a virtual network, create a virtual machine, start installing things on it. But perhaps most importantly for all of us, they're much more efficient to deploy. Unless you were prepared to get really clever in the old world with PowerShell and start looking at workflows and fire off multiple simultaneous tasks, everything was linear. It was absolutely sequential. Resource templates are not like that. When we declare our resources, we declare our dependencies. So my virtual machine, for example, might depend on the existence of a virtual network. But I might have three or four virtual machines that don't depend upon each other. And effectively what happens is when I push this template into Azure, Azure Resource Manager passes it and its goal is to try and deploy as much simultaneously as possible. So it's much, much quicker to push out quite complex environments. So to show you that, just to, um, what I'm going to do is kick off a deployment um, and We'll watch it going as I work through my presentation. So over here I've got some, some PowerShell, he said, on the wrong monitor. Over here I've got some PowerShell. All I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to highlight a couple of... ...through the, the template files. I'm going to create a new resource group, and I'm going to set a deployment going. So we're kicking that off at quarter to eight UK time. And we'll come back to that in a little while and see how far it's got and how quickly it's going. So let's, in the meantime, go back to our, our deck. Authoring templates, as I'm going to show you in a second, is actually pretty straightforward. The act of creating a new template, creating a project with a template in, and adding resources to a template is pretty easy because the tooling is quite rich. You're going to need Visual Studio 2013 or 2015. You're also going to need the Azure SDK. Now, this is one of the first things that I need to raise as something you need to pay attention to. The Azure SDK marches forward in time fairly frequently. So when I first started the, the project that I'm going to show you, we were on SDK 2.5. We're now on SDK 2.7.1. Every time they rev the SDK, they improve and rev the tooling. So I sort of have a litany now that at the start of the month I um, check to see if there's a new SDK and, and install that. You're also going to need the Azure PowerShell. Now again, this is something else that we're right absolutely on the cusp of a new version at the moment. And I kind of have different advice depending on whether you're running Windows 8.1 or Windows 10 as to which one you should, you should go for. And this is kind of the reason. So right now, the, the release version of Azure PowerShell is 0.9.8. And this observes a split between commands that talk to Azure Resource Manager and commands that talk to the old Service Manager. And you, you, you literally switch with a command between the two. And in this version of PowerShell, as you can see on the slide, we can do um, a deployment which creates a new resource group and deploys into that resource group as one single step. Now there's a couple of different alternative commands on this, this screen here. Um, the first one, when I started talking about what a, a template is, I said you've got a template and a parameters file. And this is, is an example of, of a command that you would say, um, here is my template file, and for the parameters that are specified in that template, I'm going to show you those in a little while, um, this is the file that answers those questions. Now that's okay, that'll work, it's robust, it's manageable, but I don't like it. Why don't I like it? So I live in a world here at Black Marble of um, continuous deployment. We use automated build, we use release management. And editing 
a file or having multiple versions of a file for, for multiple deployments, frankly, is a pain. Um, a lot of the tooling that we want to use now for our automated deployment, like um, Release Manager Visual Studio, maybe you're using Octopus, maybe you're using Chef and Puppet, they're very, very good at parameterizing things. And that's why I prefer the, the, the bottom option. And you'll see I've got an arrow there pointing to the minus n prefix switch. That isn't a switch on the new Azure resource group command. What, what that is, is um, the command will pass my template and it will infer the parameters that I specify in my, param uh, my template and let them be added as parameters on the command line. And that second option is much, much easier to wire in to release management or Octopus or pick your poison of automated deployments. And I find that much more manageable. However, in the new world, Azure PowerShell 1.0, which is currently in preview, moves away from that split deployment model. We no longer have service management and uh, resource management, and we toggle between the two. We have, we have sets of commands that are active for both. In the new world, we have to create our resource group first, and then we deploy into it. And that results in the, the mix of commands that you can see on the screen now. Now, I mentioned a couple of slides ago that um, my personal advice would be not to try and use Azure PowerShell 1.0 or Windows 8 or 8.1. Right now, to access the preview, the, the documentation, the instructions, the way to get it on your machine is to use OneGet. So in Windows 10, this is dead easy. You open a PowerShell prompt, you go install hyphen module Azure RM, and it goes away to the, the global repository, and it downloads the new PowerShell, and off you trot. To make that work on Windows 8.1 involves a bit of juju and standing on one leg, and frankly, I haven't made it work yet, uh, because on 8.1, if you don't have PowerShell 5 Preview, you're going to have a problem. And if you don't have um, Windows RM version 5, you're going to have a problem. I spent a while last week installing those onto my Windows 8.1 box and still couldn't get the PowerShell to install. So um, that will improve. I know the deployment story will get better. Probably not very far away because we will move from, from preview to release quite quickly. But right now, if you're on 10, Windows 10, go for PowerShell 1.0. If you're on Windows 8.1, stick to 0.9.8. So throwing our deployment at Azure is all very well, um, but we need to see what's going on. Funnily enough, I've just had an email from, from a colleague saying, I've got this resource deployment, and it doesn't tell me anything. So I have no idea whether it's working, it's not working, or what. How do we watch these things? How do we track them? Now, the answer to that is there are actually two options. I'll, I'm going to show you both. The first is within uh, what you can see on the left of, of the screen at the moment, the new Azure portal. When we look at a resource group, there is a deployment element, which is in the essentials bar, the, the, the top of the, the blade, so the left-hand blade that you can see in that screenshot. When you click that, it will show you all of the deployments that have been and are taking place on that resource group, uh, which is the, the middle, the deployment history blade that's in that picture. And as you click on a deployment, it will show you all of the parameters that were specified for that deployment and all of the elements that were within that deployment, and they'll be green or red or blue for completed, failed, or still in progress. Now that's okay, and it tells us if it fails, and it tells us what's going on, but it doesn't give us a very rich debug view into exactly what's happening. Now, the amount of debug we can get does vary from resource to resource and the kind of deployments we're doing, but Azure Resource Explorer is your friend for doing this. It is absolutely brilliant, resources.azure.com. And this allows you to explore your subscription and look at your resource group and look at your resources and see the JSON that defines them. So potentially you could build an environment once through the GUI, look at it through resources.azure.com and frankly copy and paste the JSON and start turning that into your template. What it also does is it gives us quite a lot of information while things are deploying, while things are running as to what their state is. I'm going to show you that in a little while. So, 
this is a relatively complicated set of animations to try and explain the environment that I'm, I'm, I'm deploying right now, the templates that I'm deploying right now before I actually show you it, just to try and um, explain what's going on. What I did when I ran that line of PowerShell five minutes ago was I uploaded a, a template file, demo JSON, and said, right, Azure, I want you to deploy this. And what happens is that gets loaded into Resource Manager and passed. Now, as I'm going to show you, that template file, rather than deploying resources directly itself, actually calls a series of nested templates, additional templates, which are doing the work. I'm going to show you um, how that's done, and I'm going to talk about why it's a good idea in, in a few minutes. So when I execute that, what happens is um, Azure passes it, and the first step, the first template that's called, if you like, um, is to provision a virtual network and some storage. And that storage is there so we can hold the hard drives for our virtual machines. That, if you like, is, is the foundation for the environment that we're going to push out. It has to happen first because if it doesn't, we've got nowhere to put our virtual machines or, or their resources. Once that's done, however, the next step we can do absolutely in parallel. So once the, the, the network and storage completes, three virtual machines begin to deploy in parallel. And they're creating, what we're doing is we're creating a, a machine that's going to become a domain controller, a machine that's going to become an ADFS server for authentication, and a WAP server, which is a proxy server that, that publishes that to the outside world. The idea being that at the end of the deploy, I'll have a web page that I can log into um, to show that the whole thing's running. Once those three machines are deployed, then we start to get a bit cleverer. So I'm going to talk about virtual machines in, in, in this session. And one of the great things about the virtual machines in, in Azure now is you can push extensions onto them. And extensions can, can perform particular tasks. So I'm using here a DSC extension, which is desired state configuration. So DSC is to a, a, a Windows server what the Azure resource template is to Azure. It's a declarative um, configuration file that says this is what I want the state of this virtual machine to be. So the, the DSC extension is pushed onto the machine that's going to be the domain controller and that DSC when it runs through creates a new Active Directory domain and installs certificate services. And again that's one of those um, tasks that is kind of fundamental. We can't create the ADFS and WAP servers until that's happened because we need to domain join them. When we create a virtual network in Azure, all the machines that are, are plugged into that virtual network are handed an IP address by what's called uh, DIP, Dynamic IP. It's a bit like DHCP, it's, it uses the same protocol, um, it's just it, it's not actually the same service running in the background. Now, when you create your initial set of virtual machines, the DNS address that's handed to those machines by, by DIP will be Azure's DNS. When we create our domain controller, any of the other virtual machines are going to need to know what that domain controller's IP address is to use it as a DNS. So I'm going to show you how um, we can reapply to an existing resource a slightly different configuration. So here we reapply the VNet configuration and update it to hand out a different DNS address. And once that's completed, then we can use the DSC extension to configure our ADFS servers. Again, there are no dependencies for those, so it can happen in parallel. And all of this is worked out by Azure based on me simply declaring what resource depends on what. Once that's done, then we enter something that is unfortunately absolutely sequential, um, and we're using another virtual machine extension, this time to download and execute custom PowerShell. And the first set of scripts is downloaded onto the domain controller and we create certificates for the um, ADFS service. Now as I'm going to show you, that ADFS service name is created by Azure. Um, one, of the thing I'm going to, one of the things I'm going to talk about is how you can pass properties of resources between templates so we can act upon information that we didn't know before we started the deployment. So for example, we don't know the IP address of the domain controller, we pass that into the VNet template. We don't know the, the public name 
of the um, IP address and Azure Cloud service that's created by the WAP server. So we, we push those between templates. So then we're going to run some PowerShell that creates the ADFS server, and finally some PowerShell that creates the WAP server. And when that's all finished, I have a fully working environment with a domain controller that I can access from the outside world to authenticate against. So let's have a look then at what this all means in practice. So let's just get PowerPoint out of the way. And as a good example of that, here's my PowerShell window with that deploy that I, I set going. And you can see, because I specified the minus verbose switch up here, it's telling me what's going on. So we started the deploy, 1942. It created the network and storage um, deployment. Sometimes the messages come back slightly out of order. The network and storage provisioning will have finished before it started the WAP server. But you'll see it started the WAP server, the domain controller, the ADFS server. Um, so right now, we've finished deploying all of our virtual machines, and here the domain controller DSC configuration is running. So we'll come back to that a couple of times um, through the session and see how it's getting on. So let's talk about how we create a new template. Over here, I've got an empty Visual Studio, and it really is pretty straightforward. I'll go File, New Project. And because I've got the Azure SDK installed, under Visual C Sharp, which I always think is a little bit strange because there's no C Sharp in this at all, within cloud we have an Azure resource group. Now, when I select that, create a new project, what it's actually going to do now is it goes off and talks to Azure and says, OK, Azure, I want to create a new um, resource template, what options have you got? What starters for 10 have you got for me? So you can see here in the, the UI that we've got things like a web app, web app and SQL. Um, or I can create a, a virtual machine or a virtual machine with load balancer. So the guys in the Azure team are trying to give you starter for 10 templates, if you like, to springboard you forward and maybe um, help you get to grips with this. I want to create a blank template, so I'm just going to suggest, select that from the, the bottom of the list. Hit OK. So at this point, it creates me a new solution, and it's a relatively sparse solution. So you can see I've got three folders here, scripts, templates, and tools. The meet and two veg is in templates. I've got a deployment template and a deployment template param.dev.json, snappily titled. In tools, there's a, a, a copy of AZ copy, and in scripts, we've got a deployment PowerShell script, which is there to try and, again, help you get started deploying these things. Um, read that script carefully before you start executing. It's really intended to be executed from within Visual Studio. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in there to form the basis of your automated deploy, automated build, but I wouldn't necessarily wire it straight in. Let's open the deployment template file. And you can see that we have this JSON outline tooling that's appeared. And my template is, as with the project, fairly sparse. So I've got a schema. And that changes over time. We specify the version of, of, of the template. So this is 2015-01-01. When I started this, it was 2014-something-something. Something. The overall schema for, for the, the, the resource templates doesn't change that quickly, but the schemas for the individual resources do tend to advance fairly quickly. We've got four fundamental sections in a deployment template. We've got resources, which is what we actually want to create and the settings therefore. We've got parameters, which is going to be the information that we feed into the template. Variables, where we can either specify stuff that we don't actually want people to have control over, or maybe we take some of those parameters and we fasten them together or um, manipulate them in various ways. And finally, we've got outputs which will pass information back from this template to whatever called it. So before I start looking at my templates and showing you in depth how, how these four sections work, let's talk about how to add a new resource. 
And again, this is really quite straightforward. So we hit the little add resource button up here in the top left. And again, the tooling goes away and talks to Azure and says, hey, Azure, what have you got for me? What can I create? Now, this list is steadily getting longer. Um, you can also uh, add markup in for resources that are not necessarily in this list. Um, I'm going to show you a link at the end of the session with uh, the Azure Quick Start templates that are on GitHub. And there are templates in there for things that are not necessarily on, on this list. Again, this will grow over time as the various teams within Azure plug into this deployment model. So for the sake of, of showing you, you what to do, I want to scroll down and I want to find a Windows Virtual Machine. So we started with a, a completely blank template. And the tooling is relatively intelligent. So you can see that it's, it said, OK, you want to create a virtual machine. Fine, give it a name. Oh, but hang on, I need a storage account because I need to put my um, VHD somewhere. If I have one already defined in the template, it'll appear in this list. I don't, so it says, do you want to create a new one? Yes, I do. Let's create some demo storage. Now, you can see that things start to pop up into my template as I do this, and I'll, I'll show you what's going on in a second. I'm going to need a virtual network to hold this um, machine as well, so we'll create a new virtual network. And at that point, we've got enough information. It throws in the virtual machine. But you'll notice it doesn't just add the virtual machine, which is this resource here. We've also got a NIC, a network adapter. Because uh, a virtual machine is connected to a virtual network by means of a network adapter. And what you can see here is that the tooling has splurged our template with all manner of parameters and variables. Top tip is tidy those up. Um, obviously, the tooling has to assume that this is the only virtual machine in your template. This is the only network. And um, it's, again, trying to help you that it, it gives things as parameters where maybe we don't want them to be parameters. We've got eight parameters, 13 variables there. Every time I stick a virtual machine in, we'll get another half dozen variables. One of the things that I've found is it's very, very easy if you just start clicking add resource with the tooling. It's very easy to get huge and impenetrable lists of variables and parameters. And carefully working through and, and restructuring and refactoring those is, is a, a, a really important thing to do. But you can see as we click and, and highlight the various resources that it's generated our markup for us and, and it's, it's generated in um, as much best practice as, as, as is currently there, if you like. So um, we've wired everything as parameters rather than variables that are going to trip you up or we're still wiring things in directly. It puts the resources into the template in the order that we, we add them. Again, top tip, whilst you don't have to um, add resources in the sequence you want to deploy them, it really bends your head if they're not in that sequence when you're trying to debug these things. And as I click on the different resources, you'll see that it jumps around the project file and highlights the resource. And within the resource itself, we've got our JSON markup for all of the different settings that we need to specify. Now then, I can hear you shouting, OK, Rick, where's all that documented? How do I find out what settings I need to specify? And the answer to that is that documentation is an emerging and somewhat movable feast. Um, if you look at um, the Azure documentation site, and there's a link to that at the end of the deck, articles and information is constantly being added to that. My strong recommendation actually is to have a look at the quick start templates that I mentioned earlier and have a look at those to see how people in the Azure team and elsewhere have created um, deployment templates for environments that, that are similar to, to what you want yourself and use those as a source of information. What I would say though is don't necessarily copy and paste from those templates. I would always create my own templates, add the resources through the tooling and then pull across the stuff that I need because those templates are not always kept up to date. They are being developed, they are revised, but you might look at, um, say, 
for example, the SharePoint 3 virtual machine template, and, and it might not be in line with the latest markup and the latest techniques that you've got to do, whereas the tooling will always put in the um, the latest API version, the latest markup, the, the, the latest configuration for you. Okay, so that's creating a new template file, starting to add resources. Let's close that Visual Studio and move across to mine. And let's have a look at the templates that I've been working on, and let's talk about the, the various things that um, we've learned as we've been doing this. So, the solution that you can see actually has all of the templates to deploy the full environment for the project that, that I've, I've sort of derived this demo from. And um, what I've done over here on the right, you can see that I've got a demo environment, Jason, that only pushes out a, a certain number of those. Frankly, because it's nice and easy to talk about deploying three servers, but deploying 12 gets a little bit manic. So you can see here that I've got open my demo environment JSON template, and I've tried to keep parameters and variables to a relatively small number so that I can get my head around this, quite frankly. So let's talk about parameters first. When we're creating parameters, we, we specify what type of data is going to come in there. So we can specify string, we can specify integer. Um, if I scroll down just a couple of lines, you can see that I've got a secure string here. What's the difference between string and secure string? A secure string is not displayed in the Azure portal, so you can't find what value was passed into it. So um, other people in, in, in your company, for example, perhaps can't look at that template and go, aha, Rick says George is the admin password for that environment. That's quite useful. We can also pass in objects and object structures. And we can start to specify in our parameters default values. So if nobody actually um, sets the value for env location in my template, I'm going to default to North Europe, which is Dublin. And because I only want this template to deploy to European data centers, I've got an allowed values in there of North Europe and West Europe. If somebody tries to put North US in there, it's going to bounce. You can see that not all of these parameters have got um, metadata. Well, certainly, as I work my way through, you'll see that. Uh, the, the metadata description is a recommendation from the Azure team, again, for best practice. Uh, it's not a mandatory field. It's just really trying to explain to people looking at the template what on earth this parameter is for, so they can start to figure out how the thing works. So when I call this template and, and set those parameters, I then need to use those to start to build the information for my deployment. That's where the variables come in. Now, this is sort of my third revision of, of, of this template. And at this point, anybody who watched my, my Cloudburst session will go, ooh, that's different. So what I've done here is I've created objects. And I've done this for two reasons. One reason is that it keeps the variable count in the template quite low in the tooling, so I can very easily see what's going on. Secondly, it's very straightforward to push information between templates now, because I'm just passing one object reference rather than four or five or 15 different parameters. So what I've got in here are variables that say, OK, um, I need a storage account, so I want to, to build in this template the properties for the, 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 the template that creates that storage account. So I'm going to give it a name. And I'm creating that by string concat. So I take the env prefix parameter and I append storage to it. So I give the deployment, the guy who's doing the deployment of my, my template to build his environment some control in that he can say what he wants the, the prefix to be and where he wants to put it, but so that I don't have to go completely crazy with um, parameterizing scripts and nested deploys and that kind of stuff, I'm prescriptive about what the various elements are going to be called. And as you can see here, I'm prescriptive about what my network address range is going to be and subnets are going to be. 
I'm also then prescriptive about down here, we've got things like the WAP public DNS and web public DNS. So these are the um, service names that Azure will create for me, which ultimately Now, if I look in the resources for this template, you see that I'm not actually deploying virtual machines or networks. Every single one of these is what they call a nested deploy. And a nested deploy is a link to another template file. And that raises one key thing that you need to be aware of when you're using these resource templates, which is only the template I specify in my PowerShell command is uploaded to Azure. All of the 15, 20, 300 other templates, PowerShell files, DSC configuration files, it doesn't know about those. It doesn't go and ferret them out from my machine and put them into Azure to, to be used. Which means I need to put those somewhere and I need to tell this template where they're going to be. So. What I've got here, this template link has a URI, and that's building um, the artifacts location, which is uh, a, a, an Azure blob storage path, adding the template file to it, and in here, we're adding a secure access token, which we acquire using PowerShell and pass into the original template. By doing it this way, it means that the blob storage that I'm storing all of my resources in is not world readable. Um, it's, it's private blob storage, but I'm giving Azure Resource Manager access to that blob storage to be able to download the template files that it needs. So the Resource Manager will read this template, go and get the one that I've specified, Network and Storage. And when it calls it, it calls it with parameters which are coming from, as you can see here, variables that I have in the template that, that I've, I've built here. Now, those parameters don't have to be variables. They could be references to properties of things that I've, I've created. Um, be they outputs from a template that's come back, or um, it might be a reference to a resource that I create in the template. And I'm, I'm doing both of those in this environment. I'll show you both of those. So let's move to one of our nested templates so I can talk about outputs and, and things like that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open my domain controller template. Before I do that, let's just have a bit of a conversation about the structure of my project file. Again, manageability I've found to be a conundrum with, with resource templates. Um, and I'm a fairly anal chap, so I've tried to build a structure to keep things separate. So in the templates folder that the, the tooling creates, I've created a nested deploy folder that has all of my, my child templates, if you like. And there's a DSC folder up here, which if you start adding the DSC extension, the tooling will now create that for you. The, the, the guys in the Azure team have basically arrived at the same decision as I did for, for template structure. And I've got a custom script folder, which is where I put my, my PowerShell custom scripts. I strongly urge you to try and, and, and think through how you manage your um, deployment solutions. Put folders in, just don't just stick it all in, in a, a, a single folder because you will start to get confused as to what resources are for what purpose and what they're used for. So let's open our domain controller. Now, our domain controller, again, if we look in parameters, you can see that um, I'm passing in quite a lot of information for this. I need to know the virtual network. I need to know the ID of the virtual network that's built. Now, that virtual network ID, if I just come back over here to demo environment, my original template, and go to my domain controller, you can see that my network ID and my storage ID here are set to a reference. So what that means is I want to refer to an element within this template, so that's network and storage, which is this um, nested template here. And I, I want to get one of the outputs that's come back from that template, 
called virtual network ID and I want to stuff the value of that into the parameter for my domain controller. So I have no way of knowing that virtual network ID before we do the deploy. It's, it's a grid, it's assigned by as your resource manager, but I need to get that to be able to pass it into the, the next template and that's how I do that. And the output itself, um, if I just show you at the bottom of the, the domain control, you can see how that works as well. So within the output section, we define our output and we tell it what that's going to be. So in our domain controller, we've got a reference and then this bit here is the name of the resource I want to grab um, and I build that name programmatically if you like by, by fastening variable names together and then within that resource I want to look into the configuration of that resource and find the private IP address. I'm going to show you this in a moment in Resource Explorer because I can hear you saying how on earth do I find out what I've got to pass backwards and forwards. So within my domain controller template the resources in here, I've got a domain controller NIC, a domain controller um, VM, they get deployed and then that IP address output is looking at the, the NIC, the network interface and saying, okay, NIC, what is your IP address? Now, there's another interesting difference, well, I think is interesting, in this template from the ones that I showed at Cloudburst. When I did the demo at Cloudburst, I'd got a very prescriptive deployment where I was specifying the IP address of the VMs as I built them. And I was setting those as static IPs. So every time I built it, the domain control was always four, the ADFS server was always five. That's fine. But one of the goals of the project that I'm showing you now is to build a series of, of Lego bricks, if you like, for Black Marble, that we should be able to talk, take a, a, a domain controller template and throw that into a, a new environment. And if I don't want an ADFS server or a WAP server, I won't use those. And if I want three or four SQL servers, I'll, I'll throw those in. Because I don't know what I'm building in my environment, I can't really be prescriptive as to what IP address they're going to get. So I'm creating my domain controller, my virtual machines, and you can see here when I create the virtual network card, we've got private IP allocation method, dynamic. So when it creates that network card, it's going to say to the virtual network, hey dude, give me an IP address, and it will get the next free IP address. I don't care what that is. It could be four, it could be 24, it could be 36 doesn't matter. But it's really, really important, particularly for the domain controller, once it's got that IP address, it keeps it. Now many of you might know already that if I turn a virtual machine off, it releases the lease on that IP address. Turn it back on again, there is no guarantee that I'm going to get the same IP address. So one of the things that we had to do um, when resource manager first sort of arrived when we were working on virtual machines is we had to start and stop our virtual machines in a very specific sequence and we always had to start domain controller first for example to make sure it got four and then the next server would be five and so on and so forth. I wanted to figure out how I could make my template so I got the benefit of dynamic IP but the confidence of static and this is what you can see here with this set static IP and this is sort of coming back to what I was talking about earlier on, that even though this thing's declarative overall, we can redefine what we're declaring that configuration to be. However, if we want to do that, there are some things we need to bear in mind. So, within any given template, you can have a resource of a type with a name. You can't define it twice. And of course there is no sequence in our template. So I can't have a resource called domain controller Nick whose IP address allocation is set to static and then further down the page have exactly the same thing whose IP address allocation is set to, uh, sorry, set to dynamic then set to static. 
but what we can do is we can call another nested template and providing we're careful about making sure that all of the options we defined in our original domain controller NIC we repeat in our new template changing only the things we want to change then I can redefine that NIC and that's really really powerful so what I'm doing here is I'm calling uh, another template called set static IP the only thing in that template is the NIC and you can see here what I'm passing in is the name of the network card which is from our deployment and importantly again I've got a reference here so I'm passing in the private IP address that was given to that NIC by the dynamic IP allocation and when it calls set static IP it will convert that to be a static address that that VM will always and forevermore get what that means for me in the long term is that I could throw two three four domain controllers into the template and they would all get a static IP and they would know what that static IP was but it was given to them at deploy time so I don't need to worry whether I'm deploying one machine or 50 the environment will take care of it and there's a few places that I'm doing that within this template and it's a really really useful thing to know it's a really powerful technique to use what else have we got in here so our domain controller you can see it's got a little arrow next to it and I've got a nested resource in here so virtual machines are a little unique I, I don't know of any other things off the top of my head where I can nest a resource within a resource but a domain controller has a, sorry, a, a virtual machine has extensions as I mentioned and we can define those within a resources block inside the domain controller why would we do that well one of the reasons we do that is because it's much easier then to associate that extension with the parent virtual machine up until recently I'd also found that um, deploying extensions to virtual machines was um, let's politely say flaky as hell unless we did them as nested resources that's no longer the case what I found now is it's actually quite stable and, and, and actually you'll see um, in a moment that I'm, I'm deploying um, machine extensions in other templates but this particular extension here is turning on diagnostics for our virtual machine I want to mention this one specifically because you can see there's a line here um, that is base 64 encoding text so um, in my variable block for this domain controller I've got some variables that are, are, are containing XML let me show you that and um, these lines here anything starting with WAD this was was added by the tooling for me and this is the configuration for the diagnostic extension and what that extension does is it monitors the machine and starts outputting into storage um, metrics so I can see the CPU of the, the running machines I can see the event logs that kind of stuff now there are things in here you can see up here we've got references to variables so it wants the subscription ID it wants to know the resource group that we're deploying to but the extension needs that as a base 64 encoded string which let's face it is a bit of a nightmare to try and build that and stick it in 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 these templates and be able to figure out what's going on so this is a really elegant solution that the guys have got here that they've they've created the XML string and then down here in diagnostics they use the base 64 option that you've got with, with variables in templates to say okay encode that for me at deploy time that then is how we deploy resources within Azure itself and it doesn't really matter whether we're deploying virtual machines networks SQL Azure um, you want to deploy BizTalk services your, your your web apps your logic apps all of it we can find JSON markup to deploy if like me what you're using Azure for is um, dev and test and you want multiple deployments of an environment each of which is, is is identical but separate that's when we're going to need to start to do something slightly cleverer so the first thing worth worth mentioning here is um, in my demo environment you can see I've got some variables that specify what image we're using for the virtual machine 
Now I'm talking to Integration Monday, so you guys are, are, are BizTalk guys. So you can see here the, the overall en environment that I've pulled this demo from. We've got um, a SQL server and a BizTalk server as well as ordinary Windows servers. And Microsoft publish images, VHDs, virtual hard drives into Azure that you can use as a base to increase the speed of your deployments. And it's not just um, those three. There are SharePoint images. There are images provided by third parties. And that's really handy if you want to, to prototype something or you want to test something, that you can save all of the rigmarole of finding the bits for the, the server software that you need and getting it onto v, your VM and installing your VM. But once you've got a, a, a virgin server, if you like, be it completely virgin or one with SQL Server or BizTalk Server bits on, you're going to need to configure it. All of this is completely hands-off. We have no server console that we can talk to. So enter stage left, the latest technology that um, we now use for trying to configure our servers, desired state configuration. And I want to talk to you about this for a little while because um, just like a few years ago when we, we started banging on about Learn PowerShell or Learn Golf, PowerShell has been for a number of years now um, an engineering requirement for all dev teams at Microsoft. When they're creating new products, they've got a wire in PowerShell. Desired state configuration is to now a an engineering requirement. And desired state is, is as I said before, effectively the Windows Server um, equivalent of our environment template. So if I just open my domain controller DSC template, this is our Azure environment template, resource template, and what I've got in here is an extension that's installed onto the virtual machine, and that pulls down a zip file with DSC modules in and says, hey, apply the domain controller configuration. And you're going to need a few switches, so I'm going to pass in some parameters. All of this stuff, by the way, there are a series of articles on my blog. Um, the, the markup, certainly for the Cloud App, um, Cloudburst versions of, of, of these demos is all up there. I'm going to be revising it shortly with, with this stuff as, as well. So what's in the, in the DSC zip? What gets downloaded onto our workstation, onto our server? And that's up here in our source control. So with DSC, we have DSC modules that are provided um, in part by Microsoft, in part by the community. And those modules are intended to allow you to configure specific elements, specific um, either um, software packages like SQL Server or Windows features like uh, certificate services. And they are available from the um, PowerShell um, DSC repository. And again, with some simple PowerShell commands, you can, you can download those. And my recommendation would be download them and put them in your um, environment template solution, zip them up and, and deploy them. There is an alternative way of, of doing DSC called a pull server. I'm not going to talk about that today. These then are doing the heavy lifting of configuration for me, and in here I have a DSC VM configs PS1. That's that file there. So basically it says, right, open that PS1 file and look for a configuration called domain controller, and you need to apply that to this machine. So let's have a look at that. I always promised computers would get faster. So our PowerShell file, again, is being quite declarative. So um, we have a configuration called domain controller. Now, as it turns out, if I just collapse that, you can see I've got lots of configurations in here. So I've got one file with all of the configurations for all of the different servers. And inside that configuration, we specify what resources we want to load that are going to do the configuration work for us. And then down here is the important thing. So with DSC, we can actually have a configuration with multiple nodes. 
and we can tell a server what its name is. So I could have done this with one configuration and said, hey server, you are node domain controller, go and apply my template config, and it would hit the config and only apply the, the configuration steps for node domain controller. I find it easier to read myself doing it the way that I've done it with a named configuration and node local host. And, and um, the way the DSC plugin for the DSC extension for the, the VM in Azure works, unless you're using a pull server, it's a lot easier to get your head around doing it this way. And again, this is absolutely declarative. I don't care how the DNS Windows feature is installed, I just care that it's present. I don't care how we set the DNS address on the network interface to be 127.0.0.1, just do it. So this works through and says this is what I want the configuration of the domain controller to be. So we're adding a second drive to our domain controller to host our, our Active Directory databases. We're installing the Active Directory domain services feature. We're configuring our domain. And you can see here that we've got, again, just like in our Azure template, we've got a depends on. So this line, this, this section here to install the certificate authority, it won't do that until the Active Directory domain configuration step here has completed successfully. So I can build um, a configuration where I know certain things have to occur first before um, the next step can take place. Now DSC isn't perfect. As you, you can see in here, there, there are mostly relatively simple steps in here. There are a couple of very specific and very clever things like create a domain controller, create a certificate authority. But for the most part, it's add a Windows feature, it's create a folder, um, maybe create a share. DSC is, is, I think immature is probably fair, but now is absolutely the time to start learning this if you're pushing environments out. One of the key reasons why is DSC is idempotent just like the Azure templates are. So I can reapply this whole Azure template and it will simply say that machine is a domain controller, this is how it should be configured. And if it's deviated since I first did the deploy, it will reapply that DSC and put it back. But it won't break anything that's already there. Um, if it's already a domain controller, it's not going to break the domain that's already built. And that's really quite useful. Finally, once the DSC is configured, there are certain steps that even now I cannot do with DSC, and I've got to resort to um, ordinary PowerShell. And that's what's in here. And the, the last extension I want to show you is probably the one that if you're working with virtual machines is going to be your friend, your best friend. And that is the custom script extension. One thing to know about the custom script extension, the documentation on the Azure website, unless they updated it yesterday, um, is a work of fiction. It suggests that you can simply specify in this command to execute here, the name of your .ps1 file that will fail. Um, it took me a number of days to work out what was going on and it just happened that I was trying to debug and I couldn't understand why there was a copy of Notepad running that I hadn't started until it clicked with me that Notepad is the default association for a .ps1 file. And basically what this thing does is it simply executes this command as um, the, the local system account. So if you specify something.ps1, it will shell that, which means it's going to look for the default association for that file type, which is Notepad. So what it does mean is I end up with a very, very complicated command line here where you can see I'm building running PowerShell XE with um, a file name of the script I want to run, and then I'm passing all the parameters into that file. But because it's PowerShell and I'm running a script, I can do some really clever things with that. And the nice thing about the custom script extension is I can download, as you can see here, any number of files. So I can download libraries with shared functions. I can download zip files with humongous amounts of, of script resources in, as well as the script I want to execute. 
the great thing about this is that means that all of those PowerShell scripts that you guys have already built to configure your environments, you can simply drop in here and execute. And we're doing that right now. We've, we've got scripts that, that do all kinds of clever deploys to BizTalk and update modules and configurations and create SharePoint farms. And all of that is now available to me to use. So I can push out my environment of virtual machines and virtual networks really easily and then get a massive amount of reuse for all of the IP, all the technology I've already developed to go and configure those. There is one thing you need to know with a custom script extension though, if I just open one of the files. The custom script extension shells the file as the local system account, which effectively means you're trying to configure a machine blindfold with one hand tied behind your back and boxing gloves on because the local system account has very few credentials and rights to the machine. So the very first thing I do pretty much in this script, you can see I'm getting some parameters in. I'm writing an event to the event log just so I know I've started the script, but then I do an invoke command. And that invoke command starts a new PowerShell instance on that machine running as the domain admin. And at that point, I can really get down and do the work that I need. Okay, so we've gone through at length creating these templates and, and wiring things together. Let's have a look at actually what they're deploying and, and how they're working. So conveniently, my template has deployed. Um, so you can see we started that at quarter to eight and it finished at half past eight, 45 minutes, and that's deployed a fully working environment. And I can prove that that's a fully working environment. If I open my web browser, go over here, let's just pop back to PowerShell. You can see up here what I've, I've got um, a series of variables that I fastened together. Um, and we've created an IMON2 environment, which means that the ADFS server is listening on imon2fed.northeurope.cloudup.azure.com. And I'm just going to copy that URL from over here. I'm going to paste it into my address bar. And it's going to go to that site. Now, I created a, um, a local certificate authority in that environment. So, of course, there's a problem with the website security certificate. I, I don't trust it. I don't know what the route is. But I can continue to that page. You can see that I've got my ADFS service. I can sign in. I can go demo admin at um, I'm on to dot local, which is the name of my domain. And that will sign me in. None of that existed before I started talking to you at quarter seven. We've deployed the network, the servers, the certificate authority, the federation service, the proxy, created the certificates, done the whole lot, and it's done that in 45 minutes flat, which I don't think is too bad. So what does that look like from inside the portal then? This is my um, subscription as your portal. I'm, I'm hoping that you guys are going, yay, we like the new portal. I'll pause while you are groan at me. Um, seriously, you, you need to start using this. If you're not logging into portal.azure.com, you really need to start using this because this is the way it's going. Um, new services will plug straight into this now. Old services are being migrated to this. So you can see that I've, I've got um, resource groups up here. And let's have a look at the IMON2 resource group that we just deployed. So the blade that opens shows me my resource group, and I've got my collection of resources in here. For those of you that haven't really played with the new portal, resource groups are really, really important. Um, they allow you to collect together resources into, into groups. So you might have a resource group for each um, kind of environment, dev, UAT, um, test. You might have resource groups for different products or services that your company runs, and it collects everything together. There's a few benefits that I get for that. Um, one of the most important benefits is that I can start to use this as a security container. This subscription is backed by my Azure AD, which is synchronized to my real on-prem AD. So I can grant people rights to manage resources. And I can say, hey, network team, you can manage the virtual network. 
IT guys, you can manage the virtual machines, but you can't manage the virtual network, and we, we can start applying security. And the other thing which I really like is if I hit delete on a resource group, it will delete everything that's inside it. And if, like me, you've been doing test deploys and you're playing with this stuff, that's really handy. So you can see in the resource blade, here are all of the things that we've, we've deployed with this template. But up here, it says last deployment, 2610-2015 succeeded. I'm just going to click on that, and the next blade opens up. And in here, you can see deployment history. And each of the entries in here that's got a little green circle and tick next to it is a template that got called either from my um, top level demo environment, Jason, or from within there. And I can click on that, and it will show me the individual resources down here that were deployed by that template. And it shows me the outputs from the template and the parameters that I passed into that template. So I can I can see the, the, the wiring between these things. I can see um, what settings were passed in and what came out. And if one of those had failed, I'd get information about what was going on. So let's say for the sake of argument, my network failed. That would be red. I could click on that. And in, instead of this nice, it all succeeded, I'd get the, the error output from the resource manager. And I could start looking at that and hopefully figuring out what's going on. And that might, depending on exactly what the error was, it might tell me a, a, a line number and a column number in my template that I can then go and look at. It might give me some of the output of the DSC and things like that that I can, I can go and debug. Now, I said earlier on that Resource Explorer is your friend. I'm just going to close that down for a second. This tab here is the Azure Resource Explorer. Azure Resource Explorer is a fantastic tool. It basically peers into the back end of your Azure subscription. It's talking to the resource management layer. So you can see that I've, I've logged in as me. I've connected to my Azure sponsorship sub. And I can see in here what resource groups are in here. And I can look at my I'm on to resource group. And if I just poke this to refresh. Within my I'm on to resource group, I can see the providers for the assets that are in there. So if I just expand network, you'll see that I've got network interfaces, which are the NICs of the virtual machines. I've got a network security group, an NSG, which is a set of networking rules that says um, what IP addresses can talk to what IP addresses on what ports. I've got a public IP address, which is what I just hit in my web browser, and I've got a virtual network. In compute, I've got a bunch of virtual machines. If I start looking at these resources, the JSON that comes up, you'll find is haltingly familiar compared to the JSON that I've got in my template. So this is the end result of applying that template. And I can absolutely copy and paste that and start modifying that within a template and use it to redeploy. So absolute worst case is I can copy that, paste it, redeploy, and I get exactly the same resource with exactly the same configuration. One of the things that Resource Explorer is really, really useful for, though, is seeing what's going on in the virtual machines it's firing up. And if we look in our domain controller, we have this thing called an instance view, and this is great. Every time the virtual machine boots, this instance view gets reset. And what you can see in here is the output from all the various elements that the, uh, are running this virtual machine. So um, you can see that our IS diagnostics extension is installed and ready. Our script extension is installed and ready. Our DSC is installed and ready. What disks have we got on the virtual machine? But then, down here in the extensions block, I can see the debug output from my script extension. And Trying to work out what's going on with these deploys sometimes can be a real pain because particularly within a virtual machine, you've got no access to the, the, um, the console to see what's going on. You can look after the fact and start rummaging through event logs, but if you write your PowerShell to start throwing things out, standard output, standard error, those are captured. And whilst it's not necessarily terrible, terribly readable with all these slash slash ends, new lines, and, and bits of encoding, I can see the output from my script here, and it's telling me what it's doing. So with a bit of careful instrumentation of my PowerShell script, I'm able to debug it. 
and if we just scroll down here for DSC, it's exactly the same. Every time we start that machine, the desired state configuration checks the config of the machine and reports back. So it tells us that um, it's applying that configuration or it's checking that configuration or it's needing to reset that configuration. Until I worked out how this lot worked, until I found Resource Explorer, it was really, really difficult to deploy and build these templates because effectively you were you were really struggling, you were grasping in the dark, you'd throw something out, it would fail. And effectively what you were doing was changing things, not necessarily at random because you had to be methodical about it, but you'd change something, you'd redeploy, you'd see if it worked, you'd change something, you'd redeploy, see if it worked. If a virtual machine takes 30, 40 minutes to deploy or an environment takes an hour to deploy, that's quite a slow process. Now that's another reason that I've started using these separate templates because I can throw out the domain control onto an existing network time and time and time and time again and it's a lot easier to debug and, and, and build things that way. Now Resource Explorer is great and you should absolutely use it, but interestingly enough it's also inside the new portal. So I've got it pinned to my, my start menu here, but if we just hit browse, we get a very, very, very long list and down here somewhere under R is Resource Explorer. Now if I open that, on the plus side we get pretty much everything that Resource Explorer gives us within the portal. So again I can see my IMON2, I can look at resources, but it doesn't give us annoyingly quite the same information. So I can see the definition of my resources, but I can't see the instance view. But what I can see in here that I can't see in Resource Explorer is um, a window into the deployments that I've been doing and the information that's shown in those blades that show me the steps that my deployment was taking. So I have an ADFS server. This is the template for the ADFS server. And this is equally useful because this is the template that it's acting upon after all of the parameters have been figured out. So you can see here that I've got parameters virtual network. These are the values that were passed in from my parent template. So this is incredibly useful for trapping typos and errors of string manipulation and things like that as you're passing them between templates. The one thing that I think is a crying shame is that there isn't one single place that you get the one view of all of this world. You've got to bounce around the tooling a little bit. Um, but, you know, tools that give you nothing at all, which is what we had a few months ago. And, and I, I've, I've got to shout out for the direction of travel for the guys for this one. Right. Hopefully, that's giving you a, a good insight into resource templates. Let's just go back to our deck. Um, I've got a couple more slides and then I'm going to open it up for questions. I am not in a rush to leave, so frankly you can ask me questions for either as long as you like or until the guys kick us off the, uh, off the channel, whichever comes first. First up, useful links. Uh, a lot of these I think I've already put on, on various blog posts. Um, I, I, I will do a, um, a follow-up blog post to this session and if anybody was at DDD North at the weekend where I, I did a similar session, I'm going to collect these together for you. Uh, the top link is my blog. I've done a few articles now on um, the nitty-gritty of building these templates where I share a lot of the code for, uh, whilst not this revision, certainly the earlier revision of, of, of environment templates and, and what I've discovered and, and, and things that work and don't work. There's a link there to the Azure PowerShell 1 preview which gives you documentation on how to install it. If you're running Windows 10, I would urge you to use it. If you're not running Windows 10 yet, my best advice would actually be to sit on the fence for a little while until they, they sort the deployment out, unless you're feeling enthusiastic. The Azure Quick Start templates are an invaluable guide. There are, there's got to be 50 plus templates on there. Um, and they talk about a lot of things that the, there are uh, templates for things that I haven't covered today. You want to do a website and SQL server as your SQL, they're on there. You, you want to do um, uh, service bus, things like that, a lot of those are on there. Multi-server environments, those are on there. They're a great learning resource. 
The ARM template documentation um, is growing. There's quite a lot of um, discussion articles on there. Actual documentation of the API is a little sparse. Um, they kind of assume that you're going to use Resource Explorer. I'll show you that in a sec. Um, it's linked there to Resources Explorer, and as a really big plug, if you look on Microsoft Virtual Academy, there is a free training course that will get you started on this stuff. Just before I go back to Resource Explorer to um, to show you documentation, because I'd forgotten about that, I'll apologise for that one. Um, I just want to show you this. Um, Black Marble are really pleased this year. We've been involved with Future Decoded, which is, if you're in the UK, the big uh, Microsoft event in a couple of weeks. The Patterns and Practices team are doing an architecture track on day one that we've helped arrange. If you're interested in Patterns and Practices, architecture guidance, um, Azure architecture, that kind of stuff, if you use this code to register on the Future Decoded site, it will give you access to what is otherwise a hidden track. And um, we're really pleased because we've been trying to get the patents and practices guys across to the UK for years. We finally managed to do it for Future Decoded. So um, please go and have a look. Go register. Right. I'm going to show that thanks for listening slide just because then I'm at the end of the deck. I'm just going to briefly bounce back to um, Resource Explorer and show you a slightly more devy thing in Resource Explorer, which is, if I go back up to the top of the page, you can see here that this isn't just an explorer of what there is, I can see what I can do as well. So I can click on any given resource and I can see what options I've got for that resource. And if I click on a virtual machine, you can see that I've got actions of deleting, I can capture it to an image, deallocate it, all that kind of stuff. So if I want to programmatically access the REST API, I can use this to learn. The other thing we've got is documentation for the um, resource manager API for these resources. So these are the things that I can specify inside my template and it gives me a bit of a brief explanation as to what that is. So not all of these you will notice are deployed by the tooling when I create a new resource. So that can be quite useful. And last but not least, if we don't want to use resource templates, um, we can use Azure PowerShell, and the same Resource Explorer shows us the Azure PowerShell that we can use to do that. Okay, I think I've talked for long enough, um, and I'm just kind of nicely at, at before the, the 90 minutes that I was, I was given. Uh, I'm just going to open this and see if there's anything in chat, if there's any questions. Um, Feel free at this point to shout out and tell me what you think and hit me with um, whatever you want to know.